All right, good morning everyone. Dr. Randall Gates, board certified chiropractic neurologist, also a chiropractic physician at Gates Brain Health. And today I'm talking about MTHFR and depression, the next part of our series on how depression is multifactorial. <clears throat> and we're also talking about all these different nuances for those of you who haven't been uh, seeing the broadcast till today. We're talking about these nuances because of treatment-resistant depression. So we've talked about the gut microbiome, we've talked about Hashimoto's, we've talked about gluten, we've talked about obesity, we've talked about hormones, and now we're talking about MTHFR. What is MTHFR? And I smile slightly because uh, some people have uh, a nickname for it, so to speak, uh, it's just how it looks. But uh, it stands for methyl tetrahydrofolate reductase. It's an enzyme that converts inactive folic acid from our diet to active, very simply. And you need active folic acid to detoxify things out of your body. You also need active folic acid to produce neurotransmitters, things like serotonin and dopamine and norepinephrine. So I'm going to go through a few articles that are pretty poignant in describing how MTHFR affects the brain and uh, one study looking at trauma and this in someone's genetics and how that parlays into them feeling depressed or non-depressed. I'm just going to unbutton here because it's kind of choking me. So anyway, so that is the, the topic for today. Um, given that we've gone through these other nuances pertaining to treatment-resistant depression like the gut and Hashimoto's and gluten, now we're getting more focused on the brain in these talks and the analogy I commonly use with these cases is that you want to think of your memory area as like a fertile garden especially now it's June everybody's you know planting stuff and Home Depot's busy you want to think of your memory area as a garden where you want neuronal growth um, what do flowers need? They need sunlight, they need water, they need the right nutrient density in the soil. Uh, so we want that same kind of environment for the hippocampus. And as I'll get into probably in the next couple of broadcasts, and I've talked about it so many times before, the physiology of depression is enlargement of the fear center in the brain. The fear center becomes dominant, and then it literally starts growing into the memory area because the memory area is a it's a plastic area, so to speak. So your memory area can either shrink or it can enlarge, depending on what you're giving it. And so when we have high levels of stress hormones, because this fear center becomes dominant, then the memory area can atrophy. That can further reinforce the physiology of depression. And that's where MTHFR is so important, because MTHFR, or the, yeah, the MTHFR enzyme, is very important for your brain's ability to make those neurotransmitters which are so analogous to like the fertilizer for your brain cells in the hippocampus. So this is one of the best articles I've seen to date just in describing the MTHFR issue as it pertains to psychiatric diseases. They talk about ADHD and they talk about schizophrenia but in this article they talk about depression. And so um, anybody who wants to read it, it's open access. You can go on PubMed and give it a look. So in this diagram, you can see that there are two main copies of the MTHFR enzyme as it pertains to uh, clinical reality. The 1298C is more important for hepatic biotransformation and detoxification. This is the one that's more important relative to things like blood clotting, whereas the C677T is much more important for the brain and mood and overall mental health. So you can see that if somebody has two copies of this genetic polymorphism, and typically we say they're TT, if they have two copies of the abnormal enzyme for MTHFR, their capacity for the enzyme is reduced to like 25%, which is pretty striking. Whereas for the 1298C, if somebody is homozygous, meaning they have two copies, they're at 61% capacity. So for those who are homozygous for the C677 copy, their ability for that enzyme to be active, particularly for producing neurotransmitters in the brain, 
is reduced by three quarters. So that's something to keep in mind. And when I talked about MTHFR and depression a few months back, um, also highlighted this relative to parents who are concerned about their kids. So if you're a parent and you have depression, this can be something really important to look at in your offspring and your children if you're worried about them suffering with something like depression and anxiety later in life. Um, so yeah. Now this is, this probably looks like detailed biochemistry, but basically what I want you guys, what I think is important out of this for this talk is to see that the 510 methylene tetrahydrofolate gets converted by MTHFR to 5-methyl tetrahydrofolate. <clears throat> 5-methyl tetrahydrofolate is really important in taking homocysteine to methionine. Methionine turns into S-adenosylmethionine, and then it gets converted to SAH, and it comes back over to hist homocysteine. So S-adenosylmethionine is very important for epigenetics, so you've heard that word. That's how, you know, we all think that our DNA is just set in stone. Well, we're finding that G DNA, excuse me, can be modified based on circumstances and the environment. So this is one example of epigenetic modulation. Now, on blood testing, if you want to be tested for MTHFR, it can be a little expensive. So an indirect way to see if something may be going on, not 100% because other factors can influence homocysteine, is to measure homocysteine. And it's a cheap and easy lab test generally, and that's one thing I use when I'm suspecting somebody may have an MTHFR polymorphism. Is it 100%? No, but it can be important. Are there other factors that are involved in homocysteine metabolism? Yes. For example, like in schizophrenia, they lack an enzyme called cystathione beta synthase, which breaks down homocysteine into another pathway. So their homocysteine builds up, and that can actually be a big problem in their brain. So in bipolar, they lack another uh, enzyme that breaks down homocysteine. So point being, you need MTHF, excuse me, you need active 5-methyl tetrahydrofolate, which I'm going to call MTHF, to get this biochemical pathway going. And now down here, you can also see that we need 5-methyl tetrahydrofolate and 5-methyl, eh, I should have brought some water in today, 5-methyl tetrahydrofolate to produce tetrahydrobiopterin, BH4, which then activates enzymes in the dopamine, norepinephrine, and serotonin pathways. So if you don't have good MTHFR capacity and you don't have 5-methyl tetrahydrofolate, then your dopamine, norepinephrine, and 5-hydroxytryptophan, which is going to be basically serotonin, stores are going to be low. So, point being, this is where it's so important for our mood, for eliminating anxiety, for eliminating depression, to have your MTHFR status addressed. So that's pretty cool. Uh, I kind of, you know zoomed in on the slide maybe a little too much, but um, let's see here. So depression is another major psychiatric disease. Um, what I think I wanted to point out was that there was a study over 60 month follow-up with depressed subjects indicated that the CC genotype of MTHFR, C67, were more likely to develop more severe symptoms compared to TT. I think I had that backwards actually before when I was saying TT, I meant to say CC. Um, and let me see here. This is the one that I wanted to go into. So this is a great study, again, out of translational psychiatry. It's actually not super new, but it is a little bit old. And here they took, this is a 5.5 year study. I think this is the one they're referencing. And they had a sample of 124 patients and they had 665 healthy controls. So good sample sizes. And they looked at the interaction between your MTHFR genotype and history of childhood trauma. And I'll talk about trauma in a separate broadcast. But basically, those who are exposed to trauma, it activates their fear center. Their fear, you know, if you take a child who has a pretty you know, normal life and circumstances are good and parents aren't yelling and nobody's drinking excessively and there's no abuse, then that child's brain is going to develop differently than a child who's exposed to those traumatic circumstances. And so those traumatic circumstances activate that subconscious part of their brain, their fear center, to where it becomes very dominant. 
which can then lead to sustained increases of cortisol and adrenaline the rest of their life, which can then further impair neurogenesis in the hippocampus, which can be a predictor for something like depression. It's also a predictor for anxiety and irritable bowel syndrome and chronic fatigue. So it's not necessarily going to go to depression. But we know that childhood trauma does seem to dramatically increase the probability of all these different illnesses. So coming back to this. So basically, um, let me see here. So they found, they looked at recurrence of depression. So one thing I haven't talked about a lot is that a lot of patients who have depression are likely to go into a reoccurring depression cycle, or they're going to go back into a depressive period. So they looked at the amount of time bet between depressive periods. And they found that the medium time for reoccurrence was 191 days for T allele carrying patients who experience traumatic childhood events. I don't know why the previous study said CC. I, I think I actually had it right. It's the T allele. So, so these folks were TT. Um, I know I'm going to get some comments on this, but I'm quite certain it is TT. So they were Basically, they were carrying the T allele for the C677 copy, and they had traumatic childhood events, and they had a 191-day median time for reoccurrence. Now, if they were normal for the MTHFR enzyme, basically, and they had traumatic childhood events, they had a reoccurrence time of 461 days. So MTHFR is normal, but they had childhood trauma, reoccurrence time 461 days. If they had childhood trauma and the MTHFR polymorphism C677, then the reoccurrence time was 191 days. Interesting. Now, if they had MTHFR polymorphism C677, no childhood trauma, now the reoccurrence time, you're talking about 773 days. So you almost could say the childhood trauma has a greater effect than the MTHFR polymorphism. But the two together is rather profound. And then if they don't have a history of childhood trauma, and basically um, there are no abnormalities for the T allele, and then 866 days is the time in between depressive episodes. So this is so important. I basically talked about this study a few months ago, but uh, this is one of the best ones out there examining this relationship. I think it hits home for so many people that I've talked to who have a history of depression, lots of times people are just wondering why, you know, like my life is good now, or maybe it's not good, but maybe it is good. And, you know, I have a roof over my head. Why am I depressed? Well, it's not necessarily what happened right now. Lots of times it's based on your genetics and things that may have happened 20 to 70 years ago, depending on your age, affecting your brain. And this is just a nice little graph demonstrating what I just talked about. This is that group that has the MTHFR polymorphism for C677T, and they also have a history of childhood trauma. And you can see basically their time until relapse, they're much lower in their proportion free of reoccurrence, which is going to be inversely related. But, um, so yeah, so basically this is just further discussing what I just said, and that's the point. So let me get back to Facebook and good morning to everyone who joined and glad to see you all here and hello, hello. Okay, cool. So, so yeah, that's, um, that's the story on depression and MTHFR. Is MTHFR the solo cause of depression? I'd say no. Is it an important factor? Yeah. There are other studies basically saying that people on some sort of antidepressant therapy, typically the studies are looking at medications. They do say it's important to look at C677T uh, for the MTHFR polymorphism because if you do supplement with methyl tetrahydrofolate, the active form of folic acid, then it can improve their symptoms. What I will say clinically is finding the right dose for people is a little easier said than done. And oftentimes there's just an, an element of trial and error. Frequently I serve people on a low dose. I know other doctors who serve people on a really high dose and see how they do. All I'm trying to say is that if you, if this piques your curiosity and you start taking active B9 and you don't feel well or you feel anxious, don't feel 
that you're abnormal or alone. That's a really, really common response in my experience. And the dose has to be kind of very finely, um, you know, tweaked, so to speak. I call it like screeding concrete. You know, when you're screeding the concrete, you really got to feather it out and be very gentle. It's kind of the same process with working with someone who has an MTHFR polymorphism. So that is it. If you have any other questions, let me know. And let me see here. So what is a person to do? There's no doctor out there that would ever know this. And if we mentioned the study, they would blow it off. That's also true. Uh, you can look for a functional psychiatrists. They're more open to this or other functional medicine doctors. But you're you're right on that on that point, basically. If you present this to your standard doctors, most are not going to be aware. Um, I'm not denigrating them. I'm just telling you what I see. Um, hematologists tend to be aware of MTHFR polymorphisms more from the standpoint of it promoting blood clots through the 1298C uh, pathway. But yeah, I'd say look for a functional psychiatrist or a functional medicine, functional neurology doctor. They're, they're going to be your best bet. So. Thank you, all of you, and uh, we'll be back Saturday with another broadcast, and then we'll go from there. Okay, have a great Wednesday.